obviously it's pronounced Okkulch. It's uh, Swedish, everyone knows that. Um, <laughs> but uh, more on that in a minute. Uh, my name's Dan, and uh, I'm a design engineer at Tailwind CSS. And I'm going to spend the next 20 or so minutes telling you how we moved this color from here to here. <laughs> now, I'm joking, of course. We moved some other colors at the same time. But um, the process looked a lot less like this and a lot more like this. And that's because more so than almost anything else I've researched or looked into, color is just unreasonably complex. To build color palettes, you start off thinking like, OK, I just need to understand some terms like saturation, hue, contrast, that sort of stuff. And then you run into some terms like color model, color space, perceptual uniformity. And before you know it, it's 3 AM, and you're on the Wikipedia page for electromagnetic radiation. <laughs> but let's rewind. What is Tailwind, and why do we need to redesign its color palette in the first place? So if this was a dev conference, I probably wouldn't need to do this bit. But Tailwind is a quite popular way of styling websites. It allows you to write your styles in HTML instead of in a bunch of separate CSS files. And it ships with some smart defaults, like this color palette. So you don't have to spin up a new color palette for every project. You can just write text indigo 600, and your text will be indigo. Now, a few seconds ago, I said Tailwind was quite popular. But it's probably underselling it a touch. It's been downloaded over a billion times on NPM since it was created in 2017. And right now, it gets north of a mil 14 million downloads every single week, or 23 times a second. So I think you're starting to understand the gravity of redesigning a palette like this. It's used by millions of developers on tens of millions of websites. So if it's so high risk, why, why bother doing it at all? To explain this bit, we have to go on a whistle-stop tour of how color works on digital displays. And to start that tour, we have to go back to 1996, where your computer monitor probably looked a little bit like this. This is a cathode ray tube display. And the way it works is absolutely incredible. It literally uses an electron gun to fire a beam of electrons at the screen. The screen is coated in these tiny phosphorescent dots that glow green, red, and blue when those electrons hit them. And then they use these magnets to literally bend the beam to different parts of the screen painting the picture one pixel at a time 60 times every single second. It's bonkers. But what's even more bonkers was at the time, in 1996, there was no standardized way of doing color management on digital devices. Hardware and software producers could choose to embed color profile information in their products, or they could just simply choose not to. Even if they did, there's no guarantee any of your other products could even read it. So if you had a digital image in 1996 and it looked anything the same on your computer screen, on your printer, on your camera, that was purely an accident. This was becoming a bigger problem with the web. And so HP and Microsoft set out to solve this issue by developing a standardized color space for the web and their devices. And they called it sRGB, or standard red, green, blue. Now, they specifically designed sRGB around the color capabilities of those CRTs we just spoke about so that they wouldn't need to be calibrated to work. They would just work straight out of the box with sRGB. It's pretty clever. Before we carry on, we have to understand a couple of terms. Uh, the first one is that word color space, or set of words, color space, that uh, I just used. 
A color space is actually quite an abstract concept. It basically just means a specific set of colors organized such that they are reproducible. You can kind of think of Pantone as a type of color space. I can phone up someone on the other side of the planet and say, uh, please use the color very peri or corn silk, and uh, they'll be able to reproduce that color. Now, in digital color spaces, we describe colors mathematically instead of with names. And we do this by telling the screen how much red, green, and blue to mix together to create a color. Now, a gamut is just the specific set of colors that is possible in a given color space. This uh, kind of insane shape over here, that is the gamut of all perceivable color. And this tiny triangle over here, that's the gamut of the sRGB color space. Anything outside of here is not reproducible in sRGB. Now, because we have 256 values for red, green, and blue, it means we have effectively 16.7 million colors, individual discrete colors that we can use, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually not that much. Now, you can arrange the colors in a color space however you want, actually. But when you specify them as red, green, and blue, you're sort of implying that they exist in a cube where red, green, and blue values are the x, y, and z axes. But you can arrange that same set of colors in a cylinder, if you'd prefer, and if you're comfortable doing some geometry. This is the HSL cylinder. And it allows us to talk about color in a more human-friendly way. We talk about hue, saturation, and lightness values instead of red, green, and blue values. But what's important to note is both the RGB cube and the HSL cylinder aren't color spaces themselves. They're just arrangements of a given color space, in this case, sRGB. Now, the way you arrange the colors is important for things like gradients, because when you change the arrangement, you change the distance between any two points, and you change what falls between those points. And that's why in the RGB cube, we sometimes get this gross gray part in a gradient. But in the HSL cylinder, we can completely sidestep that problem. So what does any of this stuff have to do with our color palettes? Well, you see, since it was invented in 1996, we've been sort of stuck with sRGB as the only color space we could use on the web. But we don't use CRTs anymore. In fact, our modern displays can display way more colors than they ever could. If you've ever noticed that your design looks super vibrant in Figma and super washed out on the web, that's sRGB's fault. The good news is this is actually no longer true. As of last year, we can now reliably use other color spaces on the web for the very first time. And that's why we wanted to redesign the color palette to take advantage of these new, more vibrant colors. Now. Since we have a choice of color space, which one do we go with? So you have a couple of options, right? There's the safe one, which is uh, Display P3. And the reason it's a safe one is because it's already widely supported by devices. Chances are you're using the Display P3 on your MacBook or your iPhone already. It's about 25% bigger than sRGB, especially in the greens and the reds. Um, but we have even wider gamut options with even sillier names, like Adobe RGB 1998 and REC 2020. The problem with using these super wide gamut spaces is they aren't very well supported. But what, what happens in that case? What happens if I specify a color space that an end user's device doesn't support? Well, the browser does this thing called gamut mapping, where it tries to figure out a corresponding color in a supported color space. As you can imagine, this process is kind of tricky. And uh, in practice, it produces really like, unpredictable results. 
So for us, that means that these super wide gamut spaces are sort of out of the question, because we need the palettes to be as predictable as possible on as many devices as possible. But there is one other option you may have heard of. Uh, it's called OK Lab, and it's sister color space OK LCH, or Oklus, uh, as they say in Swedish. <laughs> and the reason it's this insane shape is because it's designed to be perceptually uniform. Uh, and this is just a very fancy way of saying that when you change the hue value, the brightness is designed to remain constant. Now, the even cooler thing about OKLCH is its gamut is actually the entire spectrum of visible color. It's what's called a device-independent color space. Uh, it can be used to represent literally any color. And the reason that's cool for us is because it's sort of future-proof. We can use the OKLCH color space, but just keep the values within the P3 gamut. And then one day in the future, when another gamut is widely supported, we can just move those values. Now, in previous versions of the color palettes, what uh, Steve, Steve Shoger, would do, he would make these massive Figma files, right, with thousands of examples of how the colors would be used, and slowly, over the course of weeks, iterate over the colors until he was sort of happy. The problem is we can't do this this time. And that's because the way Figma works with color spaces is actually very different from the way the web works with color spaces. On the web, we can specify the color space of an individual color value. So we can have multiple color spaces in the same document, even on the same element. But in Figma, we set the color space of the entire document at once. And that means that all of our colors in this document are remapped from sRGB to P3. So this green over here in sRGB becomes this green in P3. The problem for us is if we just dumped our color palette in there, the greens and the reds would move much more than the purples and the blues. And that's a bit of an issue. But an even bigger issue is that we wouldn't be able to look at them side by side. We wouldn't be able to look at the old version and the new version in the same document in Figma. And so to solve that problem, we built our own tool to build palettes in. Um, you can see over here on the left, we have the like, palette picker. Um, when you select a color there, the content preview in the middle updates. Um, you can change a bunch of preview stuff. And you also get to see the old version of that palette below it. You probably can't make out much of a difference on this screen, but I promise there is one. Um, you can also change the content. So this is an important thing for us. We can check it in light and dark mode, change the examples. You can toggle the changes you're making on and off in the example preview. And you can even change stuff like the gray tones just to make sure that the changes you're making work with all the different tones of gray we use in the palette. On the right, we have the color pickers for hue, chroma, and lightness. And that little white line over there, that's the gamut for sRGB. So we always know where exactly a color falls in a particular gamut. We locked the whole thing to P3, so we can't select values outside of that. And those other little dots are just the original values of that particular hue. And we also added these steppers to have tiny, tiny incremental changes, because the, you know, the pickers were too vague. And above that, there's some like random meta information about colors, whatever. Now, you're probably thinking, Sick, fancy new color space, fancy new tool. I bet you came up with like a fancy algorithm to make the perfect color palettes. Uh, but you'd be exactly wrong. In the end, it was an incredibly manual process. It was just Steve and I on call for hours at a, at a time, moving a color 0.01 degree this way and 0.01 degree that way, until in the end, we ended up with this. The version 4 colors, or the new colors, are in the right-hand column. 
And you can see it's, it's not fundamentally different. It's just slightly more vibrant in the areas where we thought it mattered between about 3 and 800. Now, I'm fully aware that as soon as you leave this room, you will forget everything I just taught you about how color works on digital displays. And that's totally fine. But if you remember just two things from this talk, one, you should build your own tools to solve your own problems. It's a lot of fun, and it's never been easier to do. And two, the next time you see this piece of text, you should feel free to ignore it. Thank you very much. Cheers.